We read today as the sermon text, the epistle lesson. It is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. When I sat down to start working on this sermon this week, there was it, immediately one of my favorite hymns came to my mind. And so to put us all in the mood, I'm going to ask those of you who know the first verse of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross to just go ahead and join with me. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my This is one of the first hymns I remember learning. I might have been around six years old. And what I remember most about learning this hymn is how one puzzling line stuck in my head for years, my richest gain I count but loss. Thanks to that archaic syntax, many years would pass before I got the meaning, which is, <clears throat> In the face of Christ's sacrifice, everything the singer has ever acquired, added, amassed, apprehended, the singer now moves to the other side of their personal balance sheet, from gain to loss. Everything the singer used to treasure, everything the singer used to boast about, that singer now counts as less than zero, loss. But how do we understand that? Update the syntax? Consider the current version of the hymn beneath the cross of Jesus as we find it in our hymnal today. It used to say, content to let the world go by, I count its gain but loss. Now it says, content to let the world go by, to know no gain nor loss. I'm sorry, but that is a whole different message, like withdraw from the stock market or something. No, we need to hear these words, I count its gain but loss. Or, as the Apostle Paul, the source of this line, says in the New Revised Standard translation that we read today, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. There is a lot of loss in Paul's letters, even if we sometimes fail to see it. 
and we might have missed it at first in today's text. We might even have been put off by the first lines of today's text because they sound like he's bragging about his gains. The first words of this passage are essentially Paul's resume, and his credentials are impressive. So let's remember the background here. Judging from Paul's letters, the most controversial issue in the formation of the church was whether non-Jewish followers of Christ had to become Jewish to follow Christ, had to follow the Jewish law, including circumcision for males. This was a very important argument, and Paul argued strenuously against this kind of ex exclusion. He argued face to face with his own community, including Peter. Now to strengthen his position in his argument, Paul establishes himself as a member of the Jewish community. He's reminding his people that he is one of them. He grew up in the same deeply held traditions. He holds their values. He is grounded in the same holy scriptures. You want to see Jewish? Paul will show you Jewish. Here's how Paul identifies himself as a Jew. Number one, circumcised. I'm telling you it was important. A member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul is saying, hey, I go way back. A Pharisee. Did you know that about Paul? Paul spent his life in the study of the Jewish law and rose to prominence as an enforcer of every jot and tittle. And listen to this a zealous persecutor of the church. Back when his name was Saul, Paul fiercely hunted down Christ followers so they could be thrown in prison or worse. How's that for credentials? And finally, he says, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul was born a Jew and from the moment of his birth, Everything that strengthened his Jewish identity, from his circumcision as an infant to his righteousness under the law in adulthood, was a gain. Think about how you became who you are. As we grow and change from birth to adulthood, we gain so much. Competence, skills, knowledge, relationships, and all that we gain becomes part of our identity. When we think about what our hard-won identities mean to us, Paul's words about counting gain as loss take on real weight. He declares that in comparison to knowing Christ, no other part of his identity has any value. But didn't he feel grief? in making that calculation. Now let's not make the mistake of thinking as far too many Christians of centuries past have thought that Paul is condemning or rejecting his Jewish identity. That careless reading of scripture has led to centuries of anti-Semitism from which the church still bears a tragic responsibility. But what did it mean to Paul to count as loss his birthright, his years of study, his status, his righteousness under the law. That last one actually puts me in mind of Job, the world-renowned tale of a man who lost everything. In one passage, Job bemoans not just the loss of all his flocks, the loss of all his possessions, the loss of all his children, but the loss of his identity as a righteous man. He says, I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy and I championed the cause of the stranger. Righteousness was Job's identity and it was Paul's. So what was it like for Paul to count his righteousness under the law as loss? He had to feel grief. And because he was in prison when he wrote this, he had lots of time to feel it. Three times in three sentences, we hear the word loss, loss. 
And yet, the dominant emotion of this letter is by no means grief. It is joy. Paul says he prays with joy. He rejoices in prison. In the face of so much loss, what gain could possibly bring rejoicing? It must be what Paul says it is, a, surpa- a gain of surpassing value, the gain of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. What does Paul mean by knowing Christ Jesus? Look back to the previous chapter of Philippians, where Paul urges his readers to let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped, but emptied himself. For Paul, knowing Christ is becoming like Christ. And to become like Christ, Paul emptied himself of all his former gains, including even his righteousness under the law. Only by emptying himself, by letting go of his righteousness, his hard-won righteousness from his own efforts, can he be filled with the righteousness that comes from God through the faith of Christ. The Christ whom every tongue will one day confess as Lord to the glory of God the Father. When that happens, the whole world will be one community, and who's going to be part of it? Paul. Studying this passage this week, I saw a Greek word that was familiar. Maybe you've heard it too, koinonia. Fun fact, koinonia was the winning word in the uh, 2018 National Spelling Bee. I love the internet. Koinonia means fellowship, sharing, community. You might have heard it as the name of an intentional Christian community in Georgia, founded in 1942, modeled after the early church as described in the Acts of Apostles. That should feel familiar to Moravians. When Paul says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings, the word he uses for sharing is koinonia. That may give us some insight into Paul's balance sheet of loss and gain. Counting his old markers of identity as loss did not leave him lost without community. In knowing Christ Jesus, he gained a new community, the community of the body of Christ. Christ who, as it says in our Moravian ground of the unity, entered this world's misery to bear it and to overcome it. The body of Christ is the community who shares the sufferings of Christ and bears them on behalf of the world in order to overcome them together. When Paul entered the koinonia of Christ's sufferings, The identity that he counted as a loss was not discarded. It was transformed. It was all there. Paul's faith learned from his ancestors grounded in scripture. Paul's hope for right relationship. Paul's zeal all transformed into a new identity in a new community for the glory of God. That is a gain of surpassing value. Recently, I find I've been thinking a lot about loss. You know that thing I said earlier about how we go through life gaining things like competence and skills and knowledge and relationships? That is true up to a point. And then, though we don't notice it at first because it starts slowly, we begin to experience loss. Perhaps it is first felt as a loss of some part of our health or the loss of a pastime we used to enjoy, or a loss of how to navigate the world as culture changes around us and technology blazes past us. Loss, doggone it, of just the way things used to be. And worst of all, loss of relationships, loss of people we love. With every loss, we may feel like we are losing part of who we once were. 
How will we find our way to who we are now? Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Emptied himself to be like us, as our former gains give way to losses, are we being emptied to be like Christ? If so, Paul would say, rejoice. Another thing I love about the internet is how it lets me search biblical texts for the occurrence of certain words. You heard me say earlier that while Paul uses the word lost three times in three sentences, the dominant theme of Philippians is joy and rejoicing. I based that on a quick word search, which in comparison to three uses of loss, found five occurrences of the word joy and 12 of the word rejoice in the four chapters of this short letter. But I didn't want to be simplistic. So I read all around these occurrences of joy and rejoicing and discovered that almost every time Paul expresses joy or rejoicing, it's because of others around him. He tells his fellow believers he's praying with joy for your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. He tells them to welcome a brother in Christ with all joy. He calls his brothers and sisters my joy and crown. He says, I rejoice together with all of you in the same way you should rejoice and rejoice together with me. His joy and rejoicing are all in the context of his community, and we might say the same. Who are we? We are the people whose joy is in the context of Christian community. Rejoice. We are the koinonia of Christ's sufferings, bearing this world's misery and overcoming it together, doing all things through Christ who strengthens us. Rejoice! We are part of the worldwide community in which one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Rejoice! We are the body of Christ in which our identities are not lost. Our identities are transformed for the glory of God and the good of one another. Rejoice. We are those who survey the wondrous cross and embrace what is truly and eternally our very richest gain. And again I say, rejoice. Amen.